your intern with Fairfax Master Gardeners. And uh, the subject tonight is non-traditional uh, water garden plants. And here's a quick outline of what we'll talk about. First of all, in order to talk about non-traditional, we'll talk a little about traditional. And then why non-traditional plants, uh, besides the usual palette, uh, can be interesting. We'll talk a little bit about planting techniques, plant selection, uh, some examples, and then we'll uh, do some Q&A. Starting off, you know, what's a traditional garden pond plant? Well, generally three types. There are bog or marginal plants, and those are the iris, arrowhead, grasses, and so forth. And they grow on the margins of swamps and ponds. Uh, and there's a host of, uh, of these. Floaters are water lettuce, water hyacinth, duckweed. Basically, they're not rooted. They just float on the surface, and uh, they can be attractive. Uh, then you get submerged plants, which classic water lilies, lotus, which are rooted on the bottom, but they display on the surface. And here's some examples. What's traditional with these is that most of them are perennials, and you don't get too much show out of them. For example, with the, uh, the iris, uh, shown here as a yellow flag, and uh, I think it's a, uh, a black gamecock, you know, you get a couple of uh, blooms in the spring for a couple of weeks, and then after that, you've got green stalks for the rest of the summer. Uh, the floaters, that shows a water hyacinth in bloom, and you really have to be quick to catch it because it blooms for like a day or two. Very pretty, like a little orchid, but that's it. Uh, the submerged plants, the lotus and uh, lilies, uh, do well but require a lot of sun. And uh, lilies start blooming about now, mid-July, and they'll bloom all the way to frost. So that's sort of the, uh, the standard palette. Here's a, uh, whoops, wait a minute, let me get back here. This is a video of uh, my pond, which I can't seem to get the video to start. Well, anyway, the point is, while it looks fairly light in the back, it's almost total shade. And as you come forward, it's dappled shade. So this traditional plants simply don't work here because most of them are sun lovers. You think about a swamp or, or a, you know, a, a pond, generally it's open, doesn't have tree cover, and you have a sun loving plants. Uh, let's look at some factors and plant selection for non-traditional garden pond plants. First of all, the sun shade factor. You know, you can't fool mother nature. If it works well in the garden in sun, it isn't gonna work in a shady pond situation and vice versa. Uh, perennial versus annual. As I pointed out, like with irises and so forth, perennial, most of your perennials, you know, you'll get a little bit of bloom and the rest is structure or texture or whatever. Annuals, you get a lot more color. Another consideration is size when your plant is mature. You may put a very small plant into a pot embedded in the edge of the pond, and next thing you know, it's taking over. And remember, you're not gonna have to water these plants, so they'll tend to grow much faster than they would if they're sitting in your uh, you know, flower bed. Uh, what works? A uh, little experimentation. Uh, if it fails, you know, it goes in the compost. Uh, but generally, if you're looking at non-traditional plants to use in a, in a bog or, or a pond situation, any pond that's really water sensitive, it, if it rots in your, in your perennial bed, it's probably gonna, it will rot in your, uh, in your pond. Talk a little about planting techniques. Since the, the plants don't have to go looking for water, in many cases, you can simply bare root the plant, stick it into the gravel on the edge of the pond or in a crack between a rock, such that the roots go down into the, uh, the water, but you keep the crown of the plant just above the water level. Uh, you can also use a container, a standard old black, uh, you know, pot. One thing you need to do is always line the pot 
because if you're going to put soil in there, it's all going to go out the bottom. Uh, soil and gravel. You think, oh, I'm going to plant this, this, whatever it is, in my garden, pond, and gee, I want to give it the best soil conditions possible. So I'll use some potting soil. Wrong. You want to use the worst soil that you can find, and clay is in abundance in Northern Virginia, so it's not a problem finding some clay. And the reason for that is potting soil, one, usually contains fertilizers and other things which isn't too good for the water and your fish if you have any, but more important, it floats. So if you use a, a classic potting soil, it has a lot of peat or, or decayed uh, uh, bark or whatever in it, as soon as you put it in the water, it's gonna float out and you got a first class mess. So use the worst soil you can find because think of it, the plant is not using that soil for nutrients. Any nutrients in soil, if you put it in the water, is gone in a day. What it does, it roots in the soil or the gravel and it's simply a way for the plant to stand up straight and it takes its nutrients out of the, uh, the water column. Interestingly enough, plants actually help water quality because they take nitrogen out of the water, which otherwise could be feeding algae. So there's a benefit to it. Uh, fertilization, you generally don't need to fertilize any plants that you're using uh, as a, in a water garden situation. Exception to that are lotus and lilies uh, but we're not really talking about those right now. Let's look at a couple of uh, options. Hostas, I mean, let's face it, there's millions of varieties of these. Uh, they're extremely shade tolerant. They're winter hardy, perennial. There's every size and texture you can think of, but they love water. Uh, this is a the picture here is a very small uh, variegated ho hosta that I just stuck between two rocks. Uh, a couple of years ago. It's been growing there for I don't know how long. Uh, but they they just uh, thrive in a water situation. All kinds of colors and textures. I've got one that I had beside the waterfall in a pot that uh, I've been there two or three years and it winter's over. It ices up in the winter. Next spring it's back. Uh, and of course it dies down over, over the winter. Another very useful plant uh, category are ferns. Uh, of course, sh mostly shade loving. Uh, the one on the left is actually planted in a stump, or a, a hollow stump that's, on, it, that's sitting in the water. And the only water it gets is splash off the waterfall and it thrives and comes back every year, dies down over the winter. Uh, the center is a uh, Christmas fern, which is uh, abundant in this area. And the one on the uh, right hand side, just a little baby fern, has actually self rooted. It's just the spores deposited themselves in the moss on the edge of the pond and it's taken off. And I think this is the first or second year for that one. Ground covers are also very useful. Again, shade tolerant and low habit. So they're, you know, we got to cover rocks or cover gravel. Most of them are winter hardy. There's all kinds of sizes and textures. They tolerate water and you can bare root them. This is a juga, which is actually in a little beachy sort of area. And that's when it's blooming in the spring. Uh, a juga or a buggle, buggle weed, <laughs> you can say that right. Uh, will carpet, almost make a carpet and spread because the roots go down in the gravel and, and through the rocks and uh, really take take over. And it can be invasive, but you know, if you don't like it, you can pull it out and put it in the, put it somewhere else or put it in the uh, compost. Uh, various uh, pachysandras do well. Uh, they help break up the edge of a water feature, whether it's a standard or a variegated. One that I like is the Akuba. Uh, it's extremely shade tolerant and my back garden is heavy shade and by the waterfall, it's not quite a cave, but it's dark. 
I swear this thing will grow in a cave. Uh, it's winter hardy, stays green, you know, all winter. This particular plant is just stuck literally in the waterfall, has no pot. Uh, it's been there three or four years. It's rooted itself and the winter time, it gets covered with ice and snow and the leaves look a little funky. Uh, it loses a few leaves, but it comes back every year. Uh, now they do grow tall. In this case, I've cut it back two or three times, uh, but that's a very effective plant. It's, uh, it, I, I don't think you can kill these things. So you really have, oh, you can. Uh, put them in the sun for a day and they'll turn black. I just did that with one I had in the pot, but in a shade situation, uh, they do very well. If you're looking for color, uh, color lilies of, you know, hundreds of different uh, varieties, uh, vase-shaped flowers, of course they're not winter hardy, but in this case, it's just stuck in a little pot uh, and stuck in the edge of the pond with a couple of uh, rocks around it. And, uh, but they'll bloom all summer and uh, they're sun and some shade tolerant. Do re rather well. Coleus, sun, shade, heat, deer resistant. You know, you can't kill these things. Uh, they root readily, all kinds of sizes and shapes. Uh, they can get rather large. I found it's best to have them in a pot rather than just bare root and stuck on the edge, but they work extremely well. So in summary, why, why even consider non-traditional garden plants? Well, first of all, they add variety, color, texture, and they work in a wide variety of light conditions where the more traditional plants demand uh, six to eight hours of sunlight a day. Uh, they also assist with uh, water quality. And guess what? You don't have to water them. Uh, so you can experiment and enjoy the pond and, and the plants that uh, you put in it. Now, a couple of sources. Uh, Virginia Cooperative Education has a very nice two-page water garden plant document. Uh, the link is shown here. The International Water, uh, water Lily and Water Garden uh, Society. Uh, if you're a real aficionado, uh, check out that website. There's all types of, uh, oh, they do a lot of hybriding of, of lilies and lotus and that sort of thing. Uh, but there's a lot of good basic information as well. Uh, an excellent book is Water Garden Basics by Nash and Cook. Uh, you can get that on Amazon or elsewhere. So in some quick summary, uh, experiment, putting uh, non-traditional plants in a garden, a garden pond situation can be interesting, adds a lot of color and texture that you don't get with traditionals. And in some cases, traditionals just don't work. So any questions? Thank you. Did you want to talk about the two questions about the- yeah, uh, Apparently uh, someone sent in, uh, Two questions. Uh, the first question is plants for a koi pond. Uh, and the second one, where, where you can buy the, uh, the plants. The first thing I'd wanna do is talk to the person. People use the term quote koi pond in a, in a very generic sense uh, as to exactly what type of a pond this individual has. A koi pond and for example, lilies do not mix. Koi will destroy lilies. Uh, they will just field strip it. Uh, so you have to restrict yourself to plants that grow up out of the water, grasses, lotus, and that sort of thing. Uh, if you have goldfish, no problem. And in many cases, people will say, oh, I got a koi pond. Well, it really isn't. It's just a goldfish pond. And if that's the case, you. You know, you can have almost any type of plant uh, material.